Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome this evening's Master of Ceremonies, the President of the Cato Institute, John Allison. Good evening, and uh, thank all of you for being here with us tonight. Uh, this is actually the uh, largest crowd that KO has ever had uh, in New York City, and we actually have a sold-out event, which is very exciting. I think a very good sign. Thank you for that. Um, I want to particularly thank our sponsors that are here tonight, and particularly thank the sponsors that made this event uh, possible, who are listed in your program and especially the Smith Family Foundation, where Don and Julie really provided the support for this, for this event. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Julie. <clears throat> I have uh, really had the pleasure, since I've joined uh, Cato, working with an outstanding uh, board that have provided guidance to the Cato Institute for a long period of time. We fortunately have a number of our board members tonight uh, with us, and I'd like to introduce them. Uh, Baron Bond, Ethel May Humphreys, Bob Levy, who is the chairman, Howie Rich, Don Smith, Nestor Wigan, Jeff Yaz, and Fred Young. What a great group. <laughs> we are fortunate to have put together a, a world-class selection committee uh, for this award. And we have some of the participants on that committee. We call the, it's the Friedman uh, Prize International Selection Committee. And this is a very distinguished group. Uh, Vaclav Klaus is here. Vaclav is a retired president of, of Czech Republic and a world-class uh, economist on his own. And also, of course, a, uh, associated with Cato, which we're very proud of. Mary O'Grady from the Wall Street Journal. Journal, Mary. And, and Nobel Laureate Vernon Smith. Vernon, thank you. And we really should, probably should uh, recognize almost everybody here, but one person I don't want to forget is the person that really made all of this possible in many ways, and that is our uh, President Emeritus, Ed Crane. Ed, thank you. Um, if you think I pronounced any of those names wrong, I didn't. That's all Southern. I got it all right. Um, in some ways, uh, this in addition to recognizing uh, our recipient tonight is also a salute to Milton Friedman. You know, Milton Friedman was an incredibly unusual human being. He was a world-class scholar, as represented by winning the Nobel Prize, but he also had the, the ability to communicate the importance and significance of liberty to the average person. You know, I, I don't know how many people in here were in business in the 1970s, but those were pretty dark times. And I'm not sure where the, where the United States would be or where Western civilization would be if it hadn't been for Milton Friedman. He truly was a hero in advancing liberty. And, and I think a lot of us uh, learned a lot from Milton. We all owe him a great debt. I wish he could be here tonight. I want to take a minute and talk about Cato, since we have a lot of our sponsors in the room, and we have some people that aren't that familiar with Cato. Uh, Cato's uh, vision is to create a free and prosperous society based on the principles of individual liberty, free markets, limited government, and peace. Uh, we primarily do public policy research and analysis and communicate those policies within the context of those principles. The good news, our fiscal year just ended at the end of March, and we had an outstanding year. We had the best year ever in terms of operating revenues, thanks to the people in this room. That was very encouraging. And we had some record production numbers and uh, impact effects. Uh, we had hundreds of articles that were published in the academic journals. We had over about 1,000 op-eds. Uh, we published uh, uh, 1,500 blog posts. We had 1,300 radio and TV interviews by our scholars. 
Um, we had about a 50% increase in both our own line and our social media activity. Uh, we had a great year in terms of student impact through our uh, intern program and our university programs. We just held, a, by the way, a libertarian university program in Venezuela a couple weeks ago, which took some brave people to do that. Uh, we <laughs> uh, We added nine world-class uh, adjunct scholars and senior fellows with really uh, great uh, addition to our team at Cato. We had an impact in a number of other areas. Our constitutional studies group continued their great work. Uh, they filed 18 amicus briefs of cases that made it to the Supreme Court, won 15 times, the best one lo loss record probably of any organization, and beat the heck out of the government in that regard, which <laughs> we're proud of. Um, we have been very actively involved in the fight against Obamacare. We have uh, uh, some great spokesmen and Michael Cannon, uh, uh, Mike Tanner, and John Cochran who have been very visible in trying to defeat Obamacare, Obamacare, and we have not given up. We're still in the courts hoping to stop Obamacare. And we've been very vocal in trying to defend your civil liberties, your right to privacy, and in discussing the issues of the NSA and, and the issues with the IRS and a lot of other impact areas. We've been visible in all those debates. Um, Looking forward, we're going to keep doing what we're doing, but doing it better and more impactfully, of course. But we're also focusing on a couple new areas that I think are important. Uh, we're creating a center uh, for monetary and financial studies to basically take on the Federal Reserve. We believe that sound money is essential for economic well-being, and Milton Friedman would absolutely, I believe, be excited about that idea. I don't know if many people realize this, but uh, later in his career, Milton decided that we ought to get rid of the Federal Reserve, which I happen to agree with him, and that would be one of our goals long term. We'll see how that works out. But, uh, uh, we're also uh, continuing to expand our efforts in our Center for Science. Uh, we believe that a lot of what's going on in this whole debate over climate change is no longer science. It, it's a politically correct religion, and, and we just want scientific discipline. We want, we want to, let's look at the real facts, the real causes, and the real consequences. From, and we've added three high-quality, world-class adjuncts who have become very skeptical of the climate change uh, uh, claims to science. Um, you know, it's, uh, if you're in D.C., and it's kind of new to me, I've only been there a couple years, it's, it can be very depressing, I'll have to admit. Uh, and if you start looking at the numbers, we do our economic analysis, the unfunded liabilities under Social Security and Medicare and what we've done to our children, it's pretty depressing, I'll have to say that. But I have a lot of hope, and, and, I, and I say that for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons is that now, for the, the biggest percentage of Americans, as long as we've been taking polls, believe the government's got to be too big. 20% uh, of the population now really, if you ask them about their political beliefs, while they may not say they're libertarians, have libertarian uh, political beliefs, and there is a very strong student movement, uh, in libertarian student movements on campuses today, which Cato is very actively involved in. So yeah, we got some whopping mountains to climb, but I'm optimistic, I'm optimistic. It's certainly, uh, uh, there's plenty of reasons to be hopeful. One of the things we're trying to do too is uh, remind people that in addition to our policy, there's a certain set of philosophic beliefs that we think are important. And, and as libertarians, I think of us as a modern defenders of the principles that made America great. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Each individual's <laughs> each individual's unequivocal right to their own life each individual's right to pursue their personal happiness, each individual's right to the product of their labor. If they produce a lot, they get a lot, including the right to give it away to whoever they want to for whatever reasons they want to. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. As libertarians, we're primarily in the liberty business. And many people realize that liberty is a nice thing, but we realize that while liberty is a nice thing, it's a lot more than that that liberty is essential for human well-being both physically and what I'll call spiritually, that liberty is essential for human flourishing. On the physical side, in order to be productive, people have to be free to think for themselves, to explore the truths as they see them. If somebody forces you to act like two plus two is five, you literally cannot think. 
And government rules and regulations often force people to act like two plus two is five. In addition, all human progress is based on innovation and creativity. And if you think about somebody that's innovative and creative, they have to do something that's different, which is better. Creativity is only possible to an independent thinker. Somebody that thinks like the crowd cannot be innovative, cannot be creative, and cannot contribute to human progress. That's why entrepreneurs are so important. They take the ideas of scientists and engineers and, and academics and turn them into reality. And we've got many entrepreneurs in this room. In fact, uh, I think uh, if you look at libertarians, there's a great portion of entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurs have to experiment. They have to pursue their truth. They make lots of mistakes, but they have to be free to think for themselves and free to act. So human progress and physical progress is dependent on freedom. But in addition, the pursuit of happiness requires that we be free. You know, happiness uh, has to be earned. And I mean happiness in the Aristotelian sense of a life well lived. Hard work, blood, sweat, and tears happiness. When you're 80 years old, you can say, man, that was hard, but I'm glad I did it. And that kind of happiness has to be earned. You cannot be entitled to be happy. You have to set goals for yourself. You have to pursue your beliefs, your values, your truths in order to actually achieve real happiness. So as defenders of liberty, as defenders of, of freedom, we are fundamentally defenders of human flourishing in every sense of that word. And I think that is very important work that we couldn't do without your support. So thank you for your support. Our primary purpose tonight is to recognize uh, an outstanding contributor to the pursuit of, of liberty, Lesek Balsarovic, uh, who, as you will hear tonight, uh, made a huge difference in Poland and in Eastern Europe and a great example of what free markets and free societies can, can do. And you'll hear a lot more about that as we go uh, through this presentation. Uh, he is really a genuine hero in that regard. You know, it's interesting, this prize, there are lots of prizes for lots of things, but, it, but we think that this feels a missing uh, in the prize spectrum. We think this is really the Nobel Prize for Liberty, and we think that's a very important recognition. All right, we're going to have a, a video in just a minute on the history of, of, of the Friedman Prize, and... Uh, and I want to thank all of you again for being here and thank you very, very much for your support. Those of us who are fortunate enough to live and be raised in a reasonably free society tend to underestimate the importance of freedom. We tend to take it for granted. We tend to forget that freedom is a rare and delicate plant. Milton Friedman devoted his academic career to advancements in the field of economics but he gave his life to the cause of human liberty. Friedman's ideas on economic freedom hugely influenced governments, revolutionized establishment economic thinking across the globe, and they've been employed extensively by emerging economies for decades. His television series, Free to Choose, and the companion book, co-authored by his wife Rose, remain an international landmark for their impact on economics and social philosophy. The free market enables people to go into any industry they want, to trade with whomever they want, to buy in the cheapest market around the world, to sell in the dearest market around the world. But most important of all, if they fail, they bear the cost. If they succeed, they get the benefit. His major contributions to economics are too numerous to list, that they culminated in a Nobel Prize in 1976. Friedman's public face, however, will always be as a defender of individual liberty and free markets. The world runs on individuals pursuing their separate interests. The great achievements of civilization have not come from government bureaus. 
If you want to know where the masses are worth, worse off, worst off, it's exactly in the kinds of societies that depart from that. In 2002, the Cato Institute began awarding the Milton Friedman Prize for Advancing Liberty to honor significant contributions in the advancement of human freedom. Previous recipients of the Milton Friedman Prize include the late pioneering British development economist Peter Bauer, Peruvian economist and property rights reformer Hernando de Soto, former Estonian Prime Minister Mart Lahr, main architect of Estonia's remarkable economic transformation, Jan Goicochea, leader of the nonviolent pro-democracy student movement in Venezuela, dissident Iranian writer and journalist Akbar Ganji, and one of China's most influential scholars in individual rights and free markets, economist Mao Yushu. It is through this prize that the Cato Institute proudly honors Milton Friedman and the cause for which he labored so long. We will now take a short break and go to our keynote speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, from the Cato Institute Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity, Senior Fellow Andrei Ilarionov. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my high honor and great pleasure to introduce to you someone who hardly needs a special introduction, since this outstanding person is known to millions of people around the world. This is Gary Kasparov. <clears throat> Indeed, an extraordinary personality, Gary Kasparov was able to succeed in so many, remarkably many areas. First, he studied with chess. In the age of only 20, in January 1984, Gary Kasparov became the number one ranked chess player in the world, and he held this position for following 20 years, more than anyone in the history of world chess. <laughs> Two years later, at age of 22, Garry Kasparov became the youngest undisputed world chess champion, and he continued to hold the chess crown for the following decade and a half. During his career in chess, the most brain-demanded sport, Gary has achieved every highest possible position and acquired all possible trophies. He won the great Oscar a record 11 times. In 1990, Gary achieved the then highest FIDE rating ever, breaking Bobby Fischer's previous record. The Gary Kasparov's rating stayed highest in the world for 13 and a half years, and now, Gary Kasparov is widely recognized the greatest chess player of all times. <clears throat> Having retired from the chess after achieving so much in the sport that gave him universal recognition and genuine respect around the world, Gary could easily live a very good life not being involved in any risky project, exactly as virtually all other chess masters did. But in that case, he would not be Garry Kasparov. He has chosen a very different path, quite risky, and assuming the country in which he has chosen to do it, authoritarian Russia, indeed very dangerous one, politics. Even more, he has chosen the path of openly challenging the position of the most powerful dictator in today's world. It is not even to mention all political projects 
that Gary either launched himself or actively participated over the last 10 years. Committee Year 2008, United Civic Front, Civic Forum, the other Russia coalition, marches of dissenters, National Assembly, petition Putin must go, Coordination Council of Russian Opposition. Without invaluable contribution of Garry Kasparov, today's democratic movement in Russia would probably not exist. But his political career has been launched long before that. And it is as a miraculous coincidence, it happened in this exactly room, in this ball room. In September 1990, there was an open ceremony of the historic match between then the world chess champion Anatoly Kasparov and his younger challenger, uh, Anatoly Karpov and his young challenger, Gary Kasparov. And during that match, 24 years ago, in 1990, Gary Kasparov refused to play chess under the flag of the USSR, and instead played under the Russian flag. <laughs> there are many particular qualities, outstanding qualities of Gary that I would like to mention, but there's no time for that. But I will mention one, personal courage. In April year 2007, with Gary, we were working on the Tverskaya Street in Moscow towards a meeting point of participants of the March of the Centers, then the largest one by size. Our whole pass has been flanked by thousands of, as they have been so called in Russia, cosmonauts, riot police, dressed in combat style, armed to teeth, strengthened by heavy trucks, water throwing machines, armored vehicles, all of them ready to attack peaceful citizens. The psychological feeling that we had that moment was very far from if you would likely strolling along the Fifth Avenue in New York on a sunny day. It was Moscow, Tverskaya, and it was a very conscious work towards almost inevitable clashes, attacks, possible beatings, and arrest. When we almost approached the meeting point, a special platoon of the right police up to 50 cosmonauts dispatched by Putin's regime, has rounded us up in a very clear order to detain one person, Gary Kasparov. It was his first detention on political reason, but not the last one. Seven months later, during another rally in Moscow, Gary has been detained again. And again, he was arrested when he participated in the protest in August year 2012. Gary Kasparov is not only one of the smartest people on this planet, but also he's one of the bravest. Ladies and gentlemen, some of you may know that Gary is in a new fight in this moment, a new election against Kremlin. He's currently running for the presidency of the International Chess Federation, FIDE. You would probably think that a chess legend like Gary Kasparov would win such a contest easily, but it is not so simple. The problem is that his opponent is a 19-year incumbent named Kirsan Ulumzhinov. He is a former Putin's uh, appointed governor who offered the chess organization to his oligarch colleagues to loan their money and who uses his office to serve as an errand boy for the Russian security services. His photo ops over a chessboard with the Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi 
and just months ago with the Syria tyrants Bashar al-Assad. Another sort of promotion for the chess world. And Ilumjinov and his Kremlin supporters have a lot of to lose, and they don't want to lose it, and especially to Garry Kasparov. The election, this election will take place in August, with 176 chess found federations voting. So now Gary is traveling around the world in his campaign, promoting chess programs, especially in education. His nonprofit Kasparov Chess Foundation, with offices here in New York, in Brussels, in Johannesburg, in Singapore, in Mexico City, provide for thousands and soon millions of kids programs to enjoy the many benefits of chess, which builds concentration, logic, and raises academic performance across the board. As the president of FIDE, Gary plans to clean this corrupt organization, restore the glory of his beloved game, and have a high new platform for his global messages for reforms and transparency. Meanwhile, Russian embassies, but I would probably need to say Putin's embassies, around the world studied total mobilization of all possible resources by calling sports ministers, Olympic committees, chess federation presidents, in an effort to sway the election. In time of the Putin's war against Ukraine, this one became a proxy war on a global chessboard. Gary is not only a chess player, not only a politician, he is a deep thinker and prolific writer. Many of us know his regular comments in the war, columns in the Wall Street Journal and in many other newspapers that are always timely, sharp, and bringing readers to the critical point, defense of freedom and human rights around the world. But recently, Gary found a new powerful weapon to reach the millions, Twitter. Just to demonstrate the Gary's approach and style, I would cite one of my favorite tweets from Gary. Quote, I would rather have free people rather than free health care. <clears throat> As millions are waiting for Gary's tweets, this audience, our audience, is eagerly waiting to listen to Gary's Kasparov's wisdom. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my very special privilege to ask you to warmly welcome at this stage with a keynote address, a truly Renaissance type figure of our days, Gary Kasparov. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Thank you for inviting me here today to speak about a few topics dear to my Soviet-born heart. Individual freedom, limited government, and uh, traditional American values. <laughs> if only my die-hard communist grandfather could see me today. And my sincerest congratulations for the winner of the 2014 Milton Friedman Prize for Advancing Liberty, Leszek Balcerowicz. <laughs> Very much thanks to him, Poland has become the success story that gives Vladimir Putin nightmares. And for that, I personally thank Leszek. <laughs> if it can happen in Poland, it can happen in Ukraine, and that would be an unacceptable role model for Putin. If only the Western current leadership 
supported Ukraine as passionately as Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher supported the Polish Solidarity Movement. Sometimes I can't help by joking that if guys like Obama and Cameron had been in power in the 80s, I would be still playing chess for the Soviet Union. <laughs> in his 1962 book, Capitalism and Freedom, Milton Friedman wrote, history suggests that capitalism is a necessary condition for political freedom. Certainly, it is not a sufficient condition. That is, we must still fight for human rights, and that fight must be fought on principles. Like probably many in this room, I'm currently working on a book project. <laughs> I never have time to finish. Its central theme is the shift in American values over the past four decades. Reagan's shining beacon on the hill of my Soviet use has moved away from the freedom agenda, both domestically and internationally. The traditional American values of liberty, sacrifice, risk-taking, and even faith have declined. On the rise are safety over risk, equality over excellence, comfort over sacrifice, and hyper-partisanship that fights harder and harder for smaller pieces of a smaller pie. The working title of my manuscript is a little shocking to some, Un-American. But it's perfectly accurate. I'm myself literally un-American. Although I like to say that I was born in the deep south right next to Georgia. Which is factually correct. I was born in the deep south of the USSR in the capital of Azerbaijan, Baku, right next to the Republic of Georgia. <laughs> but the title Un American also comes directly from the dictionary. Adjective, not characteristic of or consistent with American customs, principles, or traditions. And in my opinion, there is much about the America in 2014 that fits that description far too well. And this is the tragedy, not only for Americans, but for the entire world. The entire world that had depended on and learned from the United States, its economy, its technology, its military, its moral leadership for almost a century. It is no coincidence that this rise of un-American values has been accomplished by a rise in global criticism of the United States and the system that made it so successful. By system, I do not mean democracy. Although the rise of China and the arrogance of dictators like Putin and Assad in the face of weak Western opposition has allowed the superiority of democracy to be questioned. An even more dangerous delusion is the increasing attack on the free market concept itself, attacks on the principles of capitalism that have created unprecedented standards of living. On one hand, the critics are correct. It is important to talk about, about the ills of society. Many have forgotten that the American dream was not simply to get rich. Immigrants did not come because they thought the streets here were paved in gold. The American dream was for your children to have a better life. The immigrants came because in America they would be rewarded for their hard work. And if they got rich in the process, well, that was okay too. In recent years, the attack on capitalism have increased as inequality has increased. It is a logical correlation, but also a false rationale. Thomas Piketty's book, Capital in 21st Century, has become the rare economics bestseller. Also, I'm not sure many of the buyers are actually reading it. 
But capitalism have not failed us. We have failed capitalism. I'm afraid my memory is not photographic, as some of the legends about me say, but I'm sure that I would remember if the works of Adam Smith included the phrase, too big to fail. <laughs> when the state steps in, deciding which companies live or die, things have gone terribly wrong. If a bankrupt small business in South Carolina can go belly up, so must General Motors, so must Goldman Sachs. Sorry guys, no offense meant. Much of the conservative conversation about the government is about making it smaller. But the size isn't everything. A small government can still be dangerously interventionist. Limiting the government power should come before worrying about its size. When you base your policies on principles, there is no room for but. We believe in the free market but. That's trouble. <laughs> we will defend democracy and freedom and human rights, but not in Ukraine. Trouble again. Rising inequality is a critical problem today, but it comes from decades of moving away from the principles of excellence that have created the richest society in history by the end of the 60s. Trying to repair the damage of nearly two generations of value shift with policies that attempt to enforce equality will only make things worse. Trust me, I am from a place where everyone was supposed to be equal or else. And it wasn't as nice as some of today's liberal commentators seem to think it would be. And as someone who looked at America through the Iron Curtain, I have strong feelings about the relationship between the importance of freedom at home and caring about freedom globally. It's obvious. Americans are tired after two long and painful engagements in Afghanistan and Iraq. Most do not want to hear about America's responsibilities or the importance of standing up for human rights around the world. But when you betray the notion that freedom is worth defending everywhere, you begin a very dangerous path for America and the world. If it matters at home, it matters everywhere. The US, Europe, and other democracies thrive with global stability. Dictators like Putin, especially ones with energy resources, thrive with global instability. Western leaders saying that they must focus on domestic issues and jobs are short-sighted and only postpone the inevitable conflict. Economic growth requires stability, and that cannot exist when Putin can annex a chunk of a European nation with impunity and launch a paramilitary invasion of Eastern Ukraine. And please don't tell me that Putin is too dangerous or Russia is too powerful today to challenge. More dangerous than Joseph Stalin when Harry Truman saved West Berlin in 1948, ordering 11 months of airlifting supply to the besieged city against the advice of his generals. What is lacking today is that leadership, leaders willing to stand up to dictators who only respect strengths. Ronald Reagan had two things more recent free lead world leaders lack, principles and the credibility that only principles can provide. Cold War was won, not just because of American technology or a disastrous communist economy. It was also values, what the whole world calls, or used to call, American values. For those of us behind the Iron Curtain, we knew people outside genuinely cared. 
that we were not alone, that Americans believed individual liberty was for all, not just those lucky enough to be born into it. Is that true today? Ronald Reagan said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We cannot take it for granted. And just for a moment, let us turn to a more academic note. Think of three fundamental documents that established in writing our definition of the modern civil society. The English Bill of Rights, 1689. The American Declaration of Independence, 1776. The French Declaration of the Rights of Man, 1789. So the question, how many times the word democracy mentioned in them? The correct answer is zero. The method of which leaders were chosen was not yet a relevant issue. The fundamental rights that define the relationship between the government and the people, that is what mattered. The right to opportunity, the right for the government only to protect, not to promote. And that is still true today. Individual freedom is the basis for the free market system of all successful economies. It's the basis of a foreign policy that says freedom for others is as important as for one's self. Risk, excellence, sacrifice, faith, unity, American values that were good for the world and good for the American economy. Not coincidentally, those are also the values of innovation and temporalism, of new technologies, new industries, and new jobs. Since roughly the 70s, there has been a gradual shift away from those values and toward their opposites. A shift towards security, equ equivalence, comfort, cynicism, hyper-partisanship. In the span of one generation, the world's greatest entrepreneurs and capitalists convinced themselves that they could be reward without risk. It's time to wake up from this dangerous delusion built on a mountain of debt. It's time to dream again of exploration and excellence and everything else that made and makes America great. In 1980, Milton Friedman said, society doesn't have values. People have values. Yes. And we must talk to people about these principles of freedom, work with people, not against them, not even for them, to rediscover the values of big challenges, of seeking new opportunities, of doing things because they are hard. It is or should be considered un-American and anti-capitalist and anti-democratic to expect a government or employer or any other institution to take care of you beyond physical security and maintaining a level playing field. <laughs> and for the government to get out of the way, the people have to demand it. Aiming high, believing in yourself and the power of your desire to change the world is an essential part of a citizenship in a democracy, especially the greatest one of all. The best way for America to strive and to lead is for it to once again serve as a model of how successful a nation can be when the government stays out of the dreams of the people. Thinking short term, thinking about the next poll or the next election or the next term has very strict limits. It can work tactically sometimes, but will fail strategically. Barry Goldwater lost terribly in 1964, but the ideas of his campaign laid the foundation for the Reagan's revolution. At some point, you have to run on principles, not just policies and sound bites. You have to run on the future of the country 
and on the future of the world. Thank you. To present the 2014 recipient of the Milton Friedman Prize for Advancing Liberty, please welcome the Honorable Phil Graham. Thank you very much. The great Ataturk observed that no matter how great political and military victories are, Unless they're crowned by economic victories, they cannot last. Nothing proves the wisdom of Ataturk saying more than the history of modern Eastern Europe. In, 19, the, in 1990 was a great political victory for Eastern Europe. It liberated itself from Soviet domination. Poland and Ukraine were both very poor countries in 1990. Ukraine squandered its economic opportunity with a corrupt economy dominated by special interest and government and failed to crown its political victory with an economic victory. And today we're all sadly aware that it is in danger of losing its sovereignty and its independence. Poland dramatically transformed its economy by implementing free market principles. Those principles unleashed the genius of the Polish people and in the process brought them an economic victory measured by the explosion of their GDP from some $1,700 in 1990 to $12,000 today. Today, Poland is the fastest growing economy in Europe. Its people are united by prosperity. It is a member of the EU and NATO, and its government is guaranteed in terms of its sovereignty and its independence. One man, more than any other person, is responsible for that transformation, and we're here tonight to honor him, Lesik Balserovich. The gallant people of Poland have a long tradition of faith and freedom that no oppressor, foreign or domestic, has ever been able to destroy. It's been called the Polish miracle. The stunning victory of the Polish people over tyranny. The emergence of Poland's thriving economy after decades of stagnation under a communist regime. Like many countries around the world, Poland has been a battleground for competing ideologies. Some that believe people need to be controlled and told what to do. Another that celebrates human creativity and the right of individuals to shape their lives and have a say in their future. In the 1980s, the fight of Polish reformers for individual and economic freedom shook communism to its core. By 1989, Poland's Soviet-backed regime agreed to free elections, ushering in the country's first non-communist-led government since World War II. A few months later, the Berlin Wall fell. Poland was free, but on the verge of economic collapse. In 1989, the economy was in a disastrous state. It was the shortage economy, goods had disappeared, inflation was actually headed to a point where it reached 17,000 percent. The economy simply was falling apart. One man was given the job of stopping Poland's economic freefall. 
Economist Leszek Balsarowicz was appointed Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance in the new government. Balsarowicz's views of markets and, and world economy were shaped by some very important thinkers, uh, Hayek, von Mises, and of course, Milton Friedman. And what he saw in these thinkers was the clarity about the importance of markets. You're gonna get a better economic result if producers and consumers are making their decisions about what to do, what to buy, what to produce, than having a few people at the center trying to do it. On January 1st, 1990, the Balsarovich plan was put into effect, freeing prices, capping government wages, liberalizing trade, and making the Polish currency convertible. This approach has been labeled shock therapy, but in Balsarovich's assessment, he was conducting a rescue operation. There were no alternatives. At that time, in that moment, it, these, were, these were very brave decisions. What Balsarowicz was doing, what the new Polish government was doing, was something nobody had ever done before. To the Poles, this was all absolutely brand new. You have to understand the, um, the bravery, really, uh, of that moment. Within three days, the market responded. Prices stopped rising, goods appeared in markets, and people began buying and selling. The collapse of socialism was difficult for generations of Poles raised under a centrally controlled economic system. But as the market took hold, the Polish people took advantage of new economic opportunities. Things progressed from selling goods out of the trunk to uh, little stands, then stands to little shops, shops to more fancy shops. And you could see the difference. There was still this very positive attitude among people, especially among young people. It was everything that uh, you wanted to do, you could accomplish. One year into the transition to a market economy, Poland recorded a budget surplus, and shortages and hyperinflation ended. Between 1989 and 2007, Poland's economy doubled in size. When Poland joined the European Union in 2004, Many Poles felt they had regained their rightful place in the mainstream of Europe. Along the way, Balsarowicz has fought for reforms to ensure Poland's ability to compete and grow over the long term. He introduced a debt ceiling into the country's constitution, curbing government spending. Later, as head of the central bank, Balsarowicz championed conservative monetary and fiscal policies, helping Poland avoid the 2009 recession that brought its neighbors to their knees. Most Poles agree their country is better off today than it was 25 years ago. Thanks to changes which occurred in Poland after 1990, the general position of Poland is much stronger. We have market economy, convertible strong currency, living standard became higher, to my generation. Despite many problems, I think that we can treat the change almost as a miracle. Today, a new generation of Poles is taking charge of its future, free from the limiting ideologies of the communist past. Next five years is a wide open future. I know that companies are in the need of strong and educated leaders. So within five years, I hope to contribute here, within Poland or worldwide. It is hard to overstate what Poland has achieved in a mere generation. From the ruins of communist mismanagement to a dynamic European economy and free society, Poland now prepares to become part of the Eurozone and continue its remarkable growth. Under Balsarowicz's leadership, Poland was the first radical reformer in the post-socialist uh, world. Uh, other countries also introduced radical reforms like Czechoslovakia and the Baltic countries, but Poland was the first. And it's easy to look back with 2020 hindsight and say, well, of course, the solution was widespread market reforms. But as Milton Friedman used to remind us, Nobody was an expert at this back then. Nobody had any experience in moving a long time socialist economy to the free market. So it required a lot of vision, a lot of courage, and a lot of technical and political skill to do this. Balsarowicz's great achievement 
was that he had enormous confidence in the free decisions of ordinary citizens and that those decisions would lead to prosperity and progress. And of course, that's exactly what has happened in Poland. Tonight, we celebrate the unwavering commitment of Leszek Balsarowicz to a free Polish society and his unshakable belief in the power and potential of his people to create their own destiny. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2014 recipient of the Milton Friedman Prize for Advancing Liberty, Leszek Balsarowicz. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footsteps on the sands of time. It's my high honor and special privilege to present the Milton Friedman Prize for Advancing Liberty to Lesik Balsarovich, and congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to invite your wife up for this. Do, do. Eva, would you come join us for this presentation? <clears throat> Senator, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> To be awarded Milton Friedman Prize is one of the greatest honors. <clears throat> As John has rightly remarked, it is a Nobel Prize for freedom. <clears throat> As we all know, Milton Friedman was a great scholar and a great communicator <clears throat> in the service of what works best in society. <clears throat> Individual liberty, free markets, and the rule of law. Therefore, I am very, very grateful to the jury for awarding me this prize. <clears throat> I am also deeply honored by Garis Kasparov's speech. As everybody knows, Gary combines an enormous intellect and a great courage which has been showing in opposing the Putin's regime in Russia. I fully share what Gary has said about Russia's invasion into Ukraine. I would only stress <clears throat> that this is an aggression of a non-democratic state against still democratic Ukraine. Aggression which pays encourages further aggression. Perhaps in some distant places, like Asia. Aggression is like a contagious disease. It is better to be stopped quite early. However, let me now turn to my native Poland. 
until spring 1989, I did not expect that Soviet Union would dissolve and Poland would be free. I did not have such a dream. It was beyond my dreams, as it was beyond the dreams of most of Poles. But I had a hobby. <clears throat> I was very much interested in market reforms. And uh, in the late 70s, I created a, an informal group of then younger economists to work on this topic. And we did it for more than 10 years. After the elections of 4th July 1989, it became clear that Poland can move ahead with radical transformation. And I was asked to take the responsibility for the economic reforms. I accepted it because I felt that by chance, I did some homework and I had a team. As one can see, sometimes it pays to have useless hobbies. The situation in Poland in late 89, as it was mentioned, was dramatic. Inflation was equal to 30-40% a month. Combined with massive shortages, we, have a, we are a bankrupt country vis-a-vis -vis the West, and output was falling. But Poland was free. And we could do what was impossible from a geopolitical point of view before. We could move to free markets and to the rule of law. <clears throat> there were basically two ways of doing this. Rapidly and on a broad front, or slowly and step by step. I felt that the first option was very risky because we were on uncharted waters. But the second option was completely hopeless. <laughs> So a very risky option is always better than a hopeless option. <laughs> and this is what gave me strength to pursue the reforms. It was not a blind faith. It was based on what I believed was a rational comparison of options. I was also in charge of policy economic policies between 97 and the year 2000. And then we accelerated privatization and the deregulation of the economy. By the way, the most important economic reforms are at the same time political reforms because they reduce the scope of politicized or bureaucratic interventions. Finally, I had the pleasure of chairing Poland's central bank during 2001 and 2007 when in inflation was reduced from 10% to 2%. Don't want to reduce it further. <laughs> I think there are many lessons about economic reforms, but let me mention two. First, be ready to move fast when a window of opportunity appears. To move fast in the right direction. One has to be ready for that. And second, work hard on the public opinion to stop the spiral of state intervention. It is better to stop it by that than by the crisis, which arises when this sort of policies are not stopped. And in both respects, I believe the role of Cato and other free market think tanks is enormous. It is for protection, if it is successful, against crisis and stagnation. And this brings me to my final remark, if I may. <clears throat> The most vocal enemies of what work best, free markets and the rule of law, are in the countries of democratic capitalism. External opponents are nowadays much weaker, even though Mr. Putin probably believes that he can overwhelm the West. But politicized economy can all work well and Russia's economy is increasingly politicized and fragile. 
It's no match to the combined economic might of the West. It's 20 times smaller and very much dependent on exports of raw materials, more than 70%. So the huge potential for the West to do more, to stop aggression or to discourage further aggression early on. As I mentioned, uh, uh, nevertheless, <clears throat> the main opponents of rural law and free markets are various status groups within democratic capitalism, including Central and Eastern Europe. <laughs> and they are of two kinds. First, kind has pecuniary motivation to get more money from the government and more regulations. But the second group is ideological. They, what they say is demonizing free markets in worshiping the state. In every society, there is a great demand for free lunch. And whenever there is the demand, there is a supply. And much of the economic profession supplies. The stories about economic miracles, which can be performed by big government. But it's not justified by any rational and empirical analysis. <clears throat> And they, this ideological status, they use every opportunity to press their case in the society. <clears throat> for example, they try hard to pin the blame for the economic crisis on capitalism. While the truth is, the most catastrophic disruptions of economic life, sometimes coupled with genocide, has happened because of the excessive concentration of political power and not free markets. Look at Stalin, <laughs> Russia. And Maoist China. Millions and millions of people perished. It was not a free market. And even <clears throat> under democratic capitalism, the deepest crisis were not, were not due to free markets. As Milton Friedman has shown, and other scholars have confirmed that, the deeper reason for the initiation and prolongation of a Great Depression in the United States were due to the wrong policies of various kinds. And as some other economists, including Charles Kalomiris, who is here, have shown that wrong policies were behind the recent financial crisis. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> against the collectivist pressures, which surely will continue, so we have a guaranteed job for the future. <laughs> to oppose them, we have to get stronger and stronger. And I am very happy <clears throat> that I can participate in this great movement for liberty, rule of law, and prosperity. <clears throat> and finally, let me say that there were some people without whom I could not sustain, launch and certainly sustain economic reforms in Poland, and without whom I would not be rewarded Milton Friedman Prize. And I would like to mention, first of all, my wife, Eva, who is here. And I will regard this as our common prize. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you for being a hero in advancing liberty. We all owe you a debt in that regard, and we appreciate it very much. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you for supporting Cato. Uh, we are all, I believe, as part of the, the, the vanguard in protecting fundamental principles, fundamental liberties that make uh, life valuable and make life worth living. Thank you very much for being here tonight, and uh, thank you for your support. Thank you.